Affairs, Harvard Kennedy School, United States. Anna Roy, Senior Advisor, Data Management and Analysis. Anna Maria Paraskov, CEO of Ubutanda World, Romania. And Paula Kift, Civil Liberties Engineer, Palantir Technologies, Germany. In the last couple of decades, the world has made huge strides when it comes to female involvement in the workplace. According to a recent report, women make up nearly half of the total workforce. But despite all the progress that's been made by women, things do not look so rosy when it comes to the tech industry. For decades, careers in the tech industry and other STEM fields have not been so welcoming to women. Here are a few stats on some of the biggest companies in the world and the percentage of women working in the tech fields. Netflix, 30%. Twitter, 17%. Uber, 18%. Facebook, 22%. Apple, 23%. Google, 21%. And Microsoft, 20%. What's worse is this number is lower than the percentage of tech jobs held from women back in the 1980s. I want to ask the panel members, we say there's a shortage of women in technology, but this is an all-female panel. Is tech still a man's world? Silvana, I'll start with you. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm going to be really blunt about this, uh, which I think everyone expects uh, us to be. Yes, this is a, uh, this is a, a man's field. I'm actually going to give you a little bit of context of where I come from for this answer. I actually own a platform that empowers people and uh, provides capabilities for people on blockchain technology. So I always run hackathons online, which are these amazing technical competitions uh, that uh, people have access to, and it's equal for everyone. Men and women have the same opportunity to have access to this competition. But guess what? Only 10% of the competitors are women, and 3% of them being Latin American women. But I'm not going to get into regions right now. The thing is, uh, and there's a big question I ask myself, why is that? Why is that happening? If I provide equal opportunities to both men and women, why is women participation so low? And the reflection that I have about this is that we are carrying the previous three industrial revolution have you know, reinforced the restrictive roles that women have had, staying at home, uh, not being so competitive, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a change both from stereotype and cultural and historical that we are struggling with and that we need to change. Uh, but it's not an easy thing. So we have to be, on my perspective, really intentional about the actions that we have to take to make uh, women more empowered, if it's the right term, uh, to have access to the technical labor field. Um, that's, that's like the big perspective on this. There's a lot of depth on to why is that? Why, why is that happening? Um, there is a bias also in, 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 in regards with the data that we have regard, uh, uh, in connection with women. We are invisible and I'm really being straight, uh, really uh, straightforward with this. We're invisible in terms of data. There's no data on women, almost none. And we are 50% of the world population. And for us to have a sustainable society, we have to have access to technology. We have to have access to technological education and to, 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 to dignify jobs. So the thing is, we need to ask ourselves as leaders, what are the intentional actions that are missing that are gonna clear the path for women to have access and to be competitive? But not only, um, and this question is not a superficial question, like we really, not, I don't have the answer to why is that, but we really need to ask ourselves, what is stopping us from uh, just grabbing these opportunities? And I hope, to, to discuss this 
with the panel, and this is why these discussions are so important. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, I'm going to go to you. Do you think tech is still a man's world? I, I would say that uh, it's not just tech. I think uh, the economy, if you see any sector, it's a man's world. So I was in finance before uh, uh, tech. So in all the uh, bank boards where I was the government nominee, uh, in all of them, barring one, I was the only woman represented. So uh, it's not just tech. I would say women participation generally is uh, on a lower side. Coming to tech, uh, obviously it, uh, here also uh, I have found uh, um, uh, women uh, not being represented so much as uh, some data points you yourself gave. But it, it's kind of perplexing. If you see the school results, you know, higher, higher secondary school results in India, uh, girls uh, uh, do much, much better than the boys. Whether it's um, a science stream or humanities or commerce, they do much better. At the same time, she spoke about um, uh, hackathons. We, we also do hackathons. And we just did a hackathon last year um, on mobility, using technology and smart mobility. Uh, the top 10 people who won were all men. Boys, boy teams. So you, you wonder that uh, when girls do so well in schools, what happens that they are not so visible uh, later on? Why are they not so much, uh, you know, in the job market? Why are they not uh, uh, getting funded as startups? So th that is a, per a perplexing thing and which kind of uh, interests me a lot that what, what happens. The other thing, I feel that um, the uh, fourth industrial revolution as, uh, as the new technology, the frontier technology has come to be uh, known as, I think that uh, puts up less of a problem for a woman. That is my personal view. Uh, and it, uh, it has made it easier for them to kind of uh, break the glass ceiling and kind of make their presence felt because of the nature of the technology. So I feel going forward, we will see more and more women uh, in the area uh, of tech because the barriers, in my view, is less. Uh, think of a woman from coming from a technology, uh, uh, you know, uh, IIT or some such place where you have Sudha, uh, Sudha Murthy, who was the only woman amongst, you know, um, the in, in, in her entire uh, batch. Uh, today, uh, you see more and more women uh, going there, uh, go, taking up technology as engineers, etc. But, uh, uh, you know, working on a shop floor is that much more difficult than doing your startup or, you know, any of the uh, uh, new frontier technology ventures. I feel the barriers would be less in the new technology going forward. And we may see a change uh, in, in the uh, coming times. That's my personal view. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Anna Maria, is tech still a man's world? Uh, in my opinion, it's just a reflection of our, our society. So I would like to, to speak more about the core problem about, uh, of uh, men and women. We face it a human problem. So you should go back to human values, ethics, to implement it in technology, to reunite it, multicultural, multi ethnic religions, races, and no more division. Because if you continue to be a man world or woman world, we will not fix nothing, we'll continue. So we will not give a legacy for the new generation because in this moment, we are focused on the present, but we don't focus so much in the future. So in my opinion, it should come to humanity because in the end, humanity will save us, not technology. We train, i.e. with uh, what we want to train. So we have to decide what we want from us. We want to be divided or united. This is my opinion. Thank you, Anna Maria. Aditi? 
unsurprisingly, I will say, <laughs> yes, it is a man's world. One thing I wanted to start off with is, to the extent that you all are interested in this topic, and thank you for coming at 10.30 at night, there is a very excellent book called Invisible Women by Carolyn Criado Perez. And a lot of what I'm probably going to say on this panel, I credit to her. So if you want to hear a more eloquent version of it, then please read that book. Um, so I think of uh, bias against women in two broad categories and how it manifests itself. The first is that in issues that are quote unquote neutral, as in issues that affect all of humanity, often the, the neutral, the default stereotype is that of a man. And I think that can be very damaging to a woman. And so an example of this um, is around, um, I think we all read the study about room temperature in corporations, right? Like it's very uncomfortable for women because the room temperature is set to something that would be comfortable for a mid 40s man. Um, there are lots of examples of little uh, decisions that make that women make on a daily basis to make their life more comfortable, and we're all used to it. I mean, even I can't hold this phone with one hand, and it doesn't fit in any pocket of any article of clothing that I own. Just little things like that that affect a woman on a daily basis. But it's not just trivial things like the size of a phone, like the temperature in a room. It actually can affect women in huge ways. So an example of this is car safety, right? Cars are built for the anatomy of a man. So, and, and there are numerous studies about the way the size of the seat, the distance that the seat is from the steering wheel, little things like that, which actually put women in a very unnatural position when they're driving a car. And when car safety is tested, all of the test dummies are male. And so all of the data that we have on car safety and the ability of airbags to prevent serious injury or fatalities is based on, a, on male anatomy. And that can be very harmful for women, and in fact, women are more likely to die from car crashes. So I think that there is this fundamental problem of issues that affect all of humanity that are viewed with a male bias. The second way, I think, in which women are marginalized and, and underrepresented is the fact that women's issues I'll put that again in quotes, but issues that only affect women are just not studied enough. And I think every woman here knows this. Like when you go to the doctor with an issue around your period or around birth control or whatever, 50% of the time the doctor has no clue what's going on with you. And it's because that area of health is significantly understudied. It's because there hasn't been enough, enough attention to that. Another example of that is um, stoves. And so women, for better or for worse, have a, diff a very different lived experience than male counterparts, right? So a lot of women spend time uh, taking care of people, they spend time, of cook uh, time cooking in the home. The number one cause of, of death for women, the number one risk factor to female mortality is the use of stoves in unventilated areas. It actually kills more women, three times more women, than malaria does. But in fact, there's been so much research and so much money poured into malaria. And I think that's great, but that's, that's an issue that affects all of humanity. But when it comes to things that affect only women, and by the way, uh, unventil unventilated use of stoves in, um, uh, in homes is also the number one killer of children under five. The reason that that doesn't get enough attention as much resources is because it's a women's issue. And I think over and over you see these things getting overlooked. Thank you, Aditi. Paula? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to second Aditi's book recommendations and also her lamentations that the one thing that stands between you and your drinks or your bed is uh, the patriarchy and automated no less, so in a way that might be a metaphor for the condition that we find ourselves in. Um, the one point I want to add to, to a lot of what has been said already is that um, I think the issues that we're discussing today are neither limited to gender nor to tech. I think what we can probably elevate this to is that um, professions that are uh, associated with uh, a lot of um, prestige and are associated with big money generally have a diversity or even a privilege problem that affects women but also other um, underrepresented communities. Thank you, Paula. Um, Anna, you mentioned that there is definitely an interest for girls at school to move into science and technology, but that's not necessarily translating into a career in technology. Why do you think that is? 
uh, first of all, I think, uh, you know, in the job market, I think there is certainly a bias against uh, women, hiring of, uh, of women uh, in, in um, critical positions, then promotion of women, then obviously the other thing which I think Aditi also alluded to, this, uh, this uh, dual role that a woman uh, plays, you know, the family, the, the continuous strife between the family and the workspace. So while at a um, junior level, I feel they may be uh, greater in number, but when you rise up the ladder, because the time and, you know, your biological clock, whatever that is, like, that is a significant, uh, I think, decision. Let me not undermine it. But uh, these things, I think, take a toll. And uh, apart from the bias, in hiring women in those, uh, in those uh, sectors, uh, I, I, I think uh, the, on, on the part of the women also, uh, to, to kind of, uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dev Jani, she is uh, president NASCOM, which is the um, IT you know, industry body of India. She uh, always says in wherever she goes that women undersell themselves and man oversells themselves. That's true. So I, I, I think uh, that also play, plays a role in uh, women coming out um, uh, uh, up front, uh, you know, uh, making her presence felt. So th uh, these are various things. Now, uh, talking, uh, you know, in another of our conversations, uh, a very uh, le uh, leading uh, women uh, bank, uh, w w w women economist, uh, Naina Lal, she said, I have a LU, lu criteria, hmm, the LU parameter on deciding how well a woman will do in an organization. So she was saying that the toilet, women toilets, you know, uh, how, where are they located? Are they at, at each floor? Do you have access to a, to a woman toilet compared to a male toilet? So, you know, this itself uh, marks that how welcome are women in a workplace. I think all these small things adds up and it shows a bias. And though not explicit all the time, I think hiring does impact it. But then uh, wherever you have open competition, uh, say in, uh, in our civil services, it's all open, you'll see women perform much better than, uh, than men. And, uh, but in the private sector, of course, these considerations uh, play a greater role. And I think that then results and gets reflected in the final numbers that come before us. Thank you. Um, Silvana, do you think governments around the world are doing enough to encourage or assist women in moving into technology? Uh, yes, uh, the answer is no. Um, I think we lack a lot of public policies and I think the government doesn't know the impact that this has on society and on global economy. Let me, let me tell you a short story, I just remember. Uh, on my flight on the way to India, I was in the lounge and uh, I had some free time. So sometimes I, I Google the most absurd questions. So I ask Google this question, how much money is there in the world? Like all of our bank accounts together. <laughs> because I really, I was curious about it, so I did. <laughs> And uh, the sum that Google gave me was like something like 36 trillion US dollars. So then uh, I was doing some research afterwards and I found that the loss on the table on global economy of not having women and uh, gender equality, the cost is 12 trillion US dollars. So that's nearly half the money in the world. That is how serious this is. So guys, uh, if you're listening, this is only not because this is the good thing to do, achieve gender equality. It's because it is good for all of us and for us to achieve a sustainable society. I mean, the numbers say it. I don't think our governments are quite aware of this. And I don't think they have taken the trouble of seeing the economic implications and the social cost of this. I don't think the government takes even a, a, you know, a minute to Google these simple things. And uh, you know, it's clear as they come. So what do we need? 
as I mentioned before, we, we need to start from the beginning, which is focus on education, have a focused leadership on, on, on being really intentional about pushing women and young women on education. And yes, there is a loss of talent. Even, for example, in the US, one of seven women that choose STEM careers actually work in STEM areas. So we, sometimes even in the US, women get the education, but there's a fail, and, and, and we have failed as a society because women are not taking the jobs they were prepared for. So that's a big question that government need to ask themselves. What is missing there, and us as a society? Thank you, Silvana. Um, Aditi, let's talk um, pay gap. So a man in Silicon Valley earns 61% more than a woman. 61% is a huge number, but it's not surprising at all. Um, do you think the gender pay gap in tech is a factor that's kind of deterring women from joining the technology field? Uh, yes, but let me, actually, can I start with something that, yeah, uh, sure. that, that you just said, Silvana, about, about what governments are doing. Going back to my point around um, about issues that affect all of humanity being defaulted to the male bias, when you look at the way that governments fundamentally measure their productivity, which is GDP, gross domestic product, it's a sum of all goods and services produced within the country, what that metric excludes is the significant amount of time that women spend taking care of children, taking care of elderly people in their family, that's nowhere reflected in GDP. And if you think about all of the policies that are based off of that one metric, right? Tax policies are decided based on GDP and which sectors are thriving and, and uh, who is hiring and where there are job losses. There are fundamental parts of public policy that use this metric and women are um, a large part of their lived experience, which again, for better or for worse, is taking care of people, is excluded from that metric. And so what ends up happening is you don't, when you don't capture the amount of time women spend taking care of children, then you don't end up making policies that benefit children and that invest in early education. There have been studies that show that if you were actually to make the care sector or formalized and paid part of the economy, then the taxes that you would collect from the wages that women get actually pays for your investment in childcare, in elderly care. So it actually is neutral, if not better, for the economy to have women working and to have their, um, have their value recognized. It's not just a moral argument, it's an economic argument. Uh, on the pay gap, yes, I, I totally agree. And, and to the point that was made uh, by Anna, I think it's a, you know, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I think women are excluded and there are a lot of biases in the industry and you see that uh, because industries are male-dominated and women don't see role models, uh, that they're less likely to select into those industries. I think that's a huge problem. The other issue is that women don't ask. They don't ask for raises. They don't ask for jobs. And if you're a guy, then, you know, I, I, it's not really your fault. I don't, I don't begrudge you for asking for a raise, or I don't begrudge you for asking for a job. I mean, if you looked on LinkedIn today, you will find that systematically men put more data on their LinkedIn profile than women do. And that's why men... Uh, agnostic of any biases and any malicious intent on the part of uh, other men that are hiring them, there's just more data on which to base your hiring decisions, and so I don't blame you for hiring another man. But I think this is a huge problem because it's not just that, uh, it's not just that women are less qualified, it's that they've been taught from an early age not to self-promote. This is ingrained in a lot of women from the age of five. So, you know, in complete honesty at the Belfer Center, if I were to do a blind selection today of women who apply for our fellowships in science and technology, if I were to do it blind, I guarantee you that I would end up with 90% male applicants. And the reason is that, you know, one, women don't self-promote on resumes. Two, they've been systematically uh, uh, cut out of opportunities since they were five years old. And so when I get applications, by the time they get to applying to a PhD program, they've got a master's, they've got an undergrad, they've got prestigious high schools, they've got prestigious middle schools, they've got prestigious internships. All along the way, the women have been cut out from them, and so it's, it builds and it builds and it builds, and if you give me an application, I will select a man almost all of the time. 
And so it, I think that there is, and this is obviously not just a women's issue, it's a racial issue. There are lots of uh, minority communities that suffer from, from ingrained uh, long-term bias. And so you have to overcorrect for that. You have to, there has to be affirmative action. You have to look at these resumes, you have to look at pay equity, and you have to think about the fact that even though women are not self-promoting, even though they're not asking for a job, are you in a position to develop them and overcome, help them overcome the biases that they've faced for their entire life by the time they get to you, you know, in my case, in the middle of their careers? Thank you, Aditi. We're going to throw to the audience now. I'm sure they're very eager to ask um, these experts some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, my name is Shashank, and I'm from Indian School of Public Policy. My question is... Um, Right now, we have a situation in which the patriarchy is also there in our data systems, in our data uh, that we have, because um, the kind of behaviors that we have shown over the past uh, and the kind of data which is being are recorded, um, those kind of trends are already there. So the algorithms that are going to run on that data, the results that we are going to get, ultimately that kind of trends will um, will be reflected. How can we tackle these kind of problems? And what kind of policy solution should we bring to tackle this uh, problem? So uh, I think, uh, you know, biases in data is not only a gender issue, but there are many other issues. And that, that is where the ethics, uh, the entire ethics debate uh, on uh, frontier technologies and data biases comes up. I think the first solution, uh, which uh, many of the uh, big companies are already working on is uh, technology. You use technology to kind of undermine uh, uh, the bias in the data set. I need not go into the various, you know, uh, measures which are uh, being, uh, whether, you know, what kind of training data you have, how, how do you uh, kind of uh, identify the bias and how do you kind of, you know, uh, curate your tra training data set to overcome the bias. All that is being done. That This is kind of research is, uh, research is on. So I think technology is the first, uh, first way out to address that. But the more important thing is uh, realizing that there is a bias. So that is where I think, you know, when the, uh, uh, frankly, when, when uh, I was given this choice by Samir, he, he offered two, uh, two panels to me and I chose this. That is when I became aware of a gender bias also. And uh, uh, working on uh, gender issues, like I, I, I'm handling the women entrepreneurship platform of Niti Aayog, and also uh, uh, kind of uh, heading the vertical in Niti, which looks at frontier technologies. For somebody like me not to be so conscious about the gender bias in data, I would say is uh, very uninformed. We talk about racial bias, we talk about various other uh, class bias, but uh, uh, for a woman not to be aware of gender bias itself shows the uh, low importance as women we give to these things. Like I said, we, do, we are not really conscious about the things which affect us. So I think the uh, important thing is advocacy for gender-based uh, gender, uh, issues is more important. Technology will always be a savior to overcome the bias in the training data. And uh, going forward, the algos will then obviously be more balanced, hopefully. That is our hope. And we are, uh, presently we are looking at uh, these issues on how to address this. And uh, I'm really thankful to ORF for having a panel on a topic uh, like this. This will then come into uh, our paper going forward, I think. Thank you. Can I, can I maybe push back on that just a little bit? Uh, and maybe this is not what you meant to say, but I don't think technology is the savior. I think technology doesn't create values, it reflects our values. Right, and so when we were creating new technology, the, the decision to have the input data be gender balanced or racially balanced or whatever it is that you're trying to control for is a human decision. 
I don't think that just having larger and larger data sets helps us in correcting biases in those data sets. In fact, it, it only confirms the bias and it obfuscates the problem because once l data sets get large enough, it's easier for companies and governments and whoever it may be to not share what the inputs in those were. And so I, I, I do just wanna underscore the fact that it is in the end a human decision and technology will only reflect the set of human decisions that we make as inputs into that, whatever, the algorithm or the data set or whatever it is we're talking about. No, so technology, obviously, what I meant was it's not just the size of the training data set. It, it's also a decision which of obviously will be the human decision on what is the nature of the data set. So all these go, and it's not just, all, uh, just the size. And obviously, without the human uh, interface, you cannot address uh, the thing. By technology, I meant that going forward, you do technology does uh, offer you a solution to overcome uh, overcome the bias through various methods. But obviously, the decision and that is where I said to recognize the problem. Unless you recognize the problem, unless you I say that yes, here is a problem, you do not work on the solution. So I think that is the important part. Yeah, and, and I believe yes. you're, you're um, raising an important underlying issue as well, which I think also touches upon why we are participating in a panel on uh, women in tech specifically and not women in business more generally, right, which we could also very legitimately be talking about. Um, but I think um, where technology comes in is that there is uh, always a risk associated particularly with new technologies that... Um, people in uh, positions of power and uh, decision-making, such as policymakers, might be tempted to seek easy technological solutions to problems that are often very complex and human that are not easily represented by digital means, right? I think the question you raise is an excellent one, and it, um, I see it as a challenge of both um, methodology and of empathy, and, and precisely actually less of technology, right? At a methodological level, there are some issues of basic statistics, right, that often get obscured when you have very large data. So you think, okay, like if you have this much data, it must be true. But obviously every person that took a basic introductory level class and survey methodology will tell you that the size of the data set does not matter if it's not representative, right? So we cannot do away with methodology just because we have big data. But I think there's also an additional problem of um, empathy as well, right? So I think particularly perfidious are problems where um, someone is not even aware um, that they might be lacking data about something that they're talking about. And, and this is not specific to men. We all face situations where um, our own experience shapes so much with regards to what we think might be normal or not, right? And if you are in an environment where everybody has the same experience as you do, then it's very easy to consider this as representative and make policy based on that, which is why representation of underrepresentative communities matters so much. Just very briefly, I just wanted to mention, this is an integral problem, the one you mentioned, Shoshank, and it needs an integral solution as well, which means uh, there has to be a concert among the different parties. It has to be, I mean, we need pol public policies, we need regulation, we need active participation of the private sector, and we also need to participate, I mean, us as a community members, to, 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 be, uh, to, to move forward and make significant efforts for us to make, uh, us, uh, uh, to make our data visible as well. But it's, uh, it would be unfair to put this problem on one party only. It needs an integral solution because it is an integral problem. Uh, thank you so much. It was really very, uh, very, very interesting contributions. And I think my question tallies quite closely with, um, with the previous one. Um, because, I mean, I, I think by the time that a woman makes it to an office where the toilet is located becomes a little bit less relevant because of all the other efforts she's already had to make to get to that office. Um, and what I, what I wondered about is you, you spoke about the, the bias inherent in data and I would like maybe to ask a little bit more specifically about the responsibility in that. So, I mean, maybe 
as women, we understand how patriarchy is made up somehow, and we maybe also understand how we could try and counter that, even though it's worked so, so, so far. Um, but now if that's automated, do you see a danger that the responsibility or the agency in that becomes more diffused? And um, wh wh how do you see, how should that be countered? Because just having more women in coding is maybe not going to do the trick. So do we need an ethicist in the same office? How do you, and I mean, maybe how does that play out in your practical experiences? Thank you. Who would like to follow? I'd be happy to start. Um, thanks, Clara. Um, I agree with you because I think, um, again, it, 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 it uh, brings to the fore that um, diversity of representation matters, not only in terms of gender, um, socioeconomic background, um, racial or ethnic background, but also disciplinary background, right? Um, uh, and this is both at the perhaps company level or at the software development level, um, but also at the educational level, right? Uh, I think I, I had the um, immense pleasure of um, having been able to do part of my studies in the United States, which I do think is more advanced in the sense that you're trying to encourage interdisciplinary thinking. Um, where, for instance, now there are programs at law schools and engineering schools that encourage um, aspiring lawyers to get a better familiarity with software development and vice versa, right? Which I think will become increasingly important. Um, the uh, German educational system where I'm from is also making progress in this, but I think traditionally still um, um, academic departments are very siloed. So if you do a law degree in Germany, it's very unlikely that you at the same time will also be doing a software course, which also means that by the time you reach a software company, your thinking will, might unfortunately be limited to um, considering the problems that you work on, purely technical problems where there are whereas they are also at the same time um, ethical problems, legal problems, social problems, right? So um, I myself work for a highly interdisciplinary team and I think it makes a huge difference with regards to um, how you think about particular challenges. Um, I think perversely, the way that technology has unfolded has not in fact led to a diffusion of responsibility, it's led to a concentration of responsibility. And in some ways, I think that makes the problem easier, right? I think 10 years ago, if you were to chart out the path of technology, everybody was supposed to be empowered and have a blog and a website and whatever. But that's not how it's turned out, right? Google runs all of our search functions, Facebook runs all of our social media, there are a handful of companies. and so. Uh, it actually, in some senses, may be easier to make change because there are only five companies that you need to really target to make change in 90% of, of data and, and technology. Um, so I think, I think, yes, part of the, the solution lies in having more women work in those companies because women are more attuned to the challenges that, that women face and are becoming more so. And it's everything from, you know, if you look at voice recognition software, like Siri can't understand me. She just can't. And that's a problem. And if, if you look at the underlying data sets that voice recognition software use, they're 90% male voices. And so how is the AI supposed to learn how to recognize a female voice? And I think if you had more female coders, they would say, hey, let's make this a 50-50 data set. Uh, in the same way that the, the association that controls emojis decided a few years ago that emojis needed to be gender neutral because women were excluded from a lot of basic communication on the internet. I think those types of changes you will see when there, there's better uh, female representation in the industries. But you know, at the end of the day, I, I come back to this, this thing that there needs to be decision making and it can be that women are advocating for women or it could be that men and women or whatever gender you identify with recognize the fact that there's economic benefit to recognizing 50% of the population and having them feel like using your product is useful, right? I would switch immediately to a phone that could recognize my voice commands. And so the fact that no company is, is focusing on that is an economic loss, it's not just a moral problem. Hey Siri, can I get the next question please? <laughs> Just the lady at the front, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Tosin Durotoye, and it is my honor to be here. What you guys are talking about, it is my passion. I live and breathe it. I'm a woman in tech, and also a woman that's focused on gender equality. And so the thought piece that I actually wrote for the dialogue was based on women and prosperity. And I actually led the establishment of the first female-focused tech accelerator program 
and the first powered by Google program in Africa, um, in Nigeria. And so once again, this is a very deep topic for me. And I just wanted to say something, then ask my question. And what I want to say is that we need money, and lots of money. Um, one of the statistics that I'd love to share is that women-led um, startups continue to receive just 2% of venture capital dollars. That's 2%. And women of color receive 0.5. Um, which means that there's no money. And it's sad because we also know that studies show that women companies get about a 35% return on investment. And so we are a good investment, but we continue to have to prove ourselves over and over again thanks to biases and so on and so forth. Um, however, I do think that there could be um, a change in the tides the more women we can get into technology because I think part of the reason why we are marginalized right now is because there are not eno enough of us. And I think sometimes when you start to reach peak or you start to balance out half-half, um, people start to pay attention. And so I think a huge part of our issue is that we're not representing ourselves in that space. And so it continues to be a challenge that I'm trying to wrap my mind around is how do we increase the number of women that are in tech. So I know right now there are lots of programs and STEM programs and you know, and I don't know when we're gonna see the effects and the impact of that, but is there something more that we need to be doing as individuals? Because as we go into the, four, I mean we are in the fourth industrial revolution and we cannot move forward if half of the population is not participating in the innovation that we need to drive our economies forward. And so if anyone just has any thoughts other, other than like the feel good things that we're doing, you know, bringing the kindergartners to come and do some, you know, coding classes, you know, like what else can we be doing just to make sure that women are really gaining a foothold in technology? Because that's really what's going to change this conversation ultimately, I think. Thank you. Anna Maria. Uh, so um, I'm coming from Romania. That is a leader's... Um, I'm coming from Romania, that is leader tech in Europe for women. We have 30% um, tech in Romania. So for me, it's really difficult to understand this gender gap in technology. So we have a lot of uh, foundation made by women that raising money. Because why? Corporation, big corporation, they don't need only men, they need workforce. So automatic women should be in, uh, in technology. In Romania was another case. After the communism, we were studying a lot of math and science. So we are obliged to work in this industry. So in my opinion, it's reskilling women. So there are corporations that go to university and train uh, practically women. And, um, Every woman can learn code, what I heard in Romania. Coding is not only, only about uh, math and so It's about sharing communication and people. And women in Romania think that tech make them free, feel free. So in my opinion, it's education and men to share their experience. Because even we are in a man world, in my experience, I, for 14 years, I work only with men. So it's not was easy, but was challenging. And uh, I take a step back, I observe her, and uh, little by little, I learn from them. They realize that I'm interested, so they take me to their umbrella and uh, give me support, and I am what I am today because of the men. So in my opinion, everything is possible, and I'm 100% in the future, corporations are ob they need workforce, so, we, so it's our part just to be confident and uh, take the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. I, I would like to add something about that. I mean, there's going to be uh, approximately, according to statistics, a shortage of 40 million jobs uh, in the next few years on tech. So, I mean, there's an opportunity for us. And also, on a personal note, I want to point out, I'm an entrepreneur. I graduated from MIT. So I come from an Ivy League school. But you know, I can, tell, I can tell you a thousand stories of how hard it is to get funding, even coming from MIT and being in the US as a woman. And uh, as I, I learned that uh, you know, in, in the US, Latin American women, black women were called women of color. 
and uh, our statistics and getting funding are so low and there is so many resources. So uh, it's really hard, but the steps, the immediate steps that I think that should be taken, I mean, spaces like this are absolutely necessary for our voices to be heard. There's also lots of resources that are now being created, like the VC funds that are intentionally directed because they recognize that the return, the ROI, the return of investment of a startup, a female startup, is like something like three to one in connection with uh, male-founded startups. Now, I do not have, and I cannot emphasize this enough about startups founded by men. I've also been in startups co-founded with men, and it's amazing. I just need that we, I just want to point out that we need affirmative action for, um, for allowing uh, female-founded startups to actually get some money. So I would just like to add to that about this initiative which we launched. And uh, we realized that one of the missing links is actually uh, access to information. So the right information is not available in a manner seamlessly. And uh, either there is too much of information, so you don't know what is really uh, you know, relevant to you and you lose interest. So we set up this platform, the Women Entrepreneurship Platform, which is the aggregator, really. All we are doing is building the community because I fe feel that, you know, unless you talk about these things, and these fora are really, forums are really, uh, you know, relevant, but the uh, women folk who really need this kind of a support will never uh, be uh, in any of these uh, discussions. And um, at least for India, I can say that. And uh, this platform uh, takes uh, the, um, you know, builds the ecosystem, builds a community where uh, somebody in a tier two, tier three city also will be, uh, will realize the potential which is out there. You know, it's not always uh, that uh, you, you f uh, face a bias. It's also women not coming forward because of lack of information. I think information is also crucial, the right set of information, and that is the role which this platform is providing. And uh, the kind of uh, response that we have seen is amazing. And the kind of emails that we get from women who say that we were not aware about this accelerator program, we were not ab uh, aware about this cohort, we were not aware about this incubator, and you have really helped us. So all we are doing is connecting the dots. So I think it's very, you know, to keep on complaining that it's a man's world, we are not getting a uh, fair opportunity. You can keep on complaining till, uh, you know, whatever. But I think uh, while we can uh, keep saying the government should do it, we need affirmative action and uh, everybody else can do it. I think we should look inwards and women need to help other women through this community development. And that is the role which this platform uh, is really providing. And we are getting, we are pretty young. It was launched in March uh, 2018. And uh, we are getting a lot of good uh, response, really. Thank you so much, Anna. We only have time for two more questions. What about some guys? Can we hear from some men? This one. I mean, uh, thank you. Uh, it was indeed a spectacular pa uh, panel. I just had a quick question for Ms. Roy and uh, Ms. Kumar. Uh, Ma'am, so uh, the Women Entrepreneurship Cell has seen phenomenal applications from all, all walks of life. Some of them even I have seen. What really surprised you when you launched this platform and to now? What has been one insight that really you did not expect, but you saw? One, you spoke about the outreach, but any other thing that jumped out at you? And uh, Ms. Kumar, I thought that the point that you mentioned about uh, men selling themselves more or providing data about themselves on public platforms is absolutely right. It's just that uh, I also feel that perhaps organizations, business schools uh, can also redesign their application process. Because if you analyze the questions of top business schools and top policy programs, a lot of them are designed um, in a way that uh, it requires in selling in a different way. And I know I've written those and uh, gotten through. But I, I, at the essence of it, it is about telling how much you've accomplished in a condensed period of time. 
perhaps if we redesign the process a little bit and ask questions which are not directly related to selling obliquely or directly, uh, we might achieve different outcomes. I just, I know you've studied this perhaps, I'd be curious to hear your perspective. I think uh, uh, one thing I would like to, as a disclaimer, say when when women, uh, uh, this was in 2017 that uh, uh, CEO Niti Aayog announced uh, that a women entrepreneurship cell will be set up, and I will be heading it. It came as a surprise. Uh, my entire career, I have never worked on a gender-based, uh, um, you know, no work was ever assigned to me on a gender-based uh, subject. So I was not really. Uh, sensitive to a gender-based issue, frankly speaking. And I did not relate it uh, to one also because my entire study career, I never faced a gender-based uh, problem. I, I, I really had it, and you know, people are surprised, but that's a fact. I, uh, I, I had it good, perhaps because uh, I, uh, I did not have the dual kind of a obligation which a, uh, which a woman really has. I, and I, my thing was entirely 100% work. So perhaps that's the reason that I never faced a problem. So uh, Utkarsh asked, wh what was the surprising uh, uh, one thing which surprised? First of all, I became conscious about the gender bias after working on the platform. And I realized how difficult it is for a woman Funding, you know, these uh, uh, numbers are often quoted. It is not an India-specific thing. It's a global thing. The VC funding going to women-led entrepreneur, uh, uh, women-led uh, companies. The second thing is, which really, you know, we do this Women Transforming India Awards every year. Last year we had, uh, we selected 15. This year we again will be announcing the awards soon. The best part was all the men industry leaders who come as jury members and they are raving about those women, but none of them actually see through, you know, they are funders, they are investors, but while they say, oh, wonderful women, wonderful initiative, what surprised me most that these industry leaders do not follow up these things and despite our pushing them, we have seen very little result of these uh, male industry uh, leaders uh, following up with uh, you know actual uh, concrete uh, proposals or initiatives being funded or taken up or even mentoring and mentoring is something i feel is totally abused in india today you just want your picture uh, somewhere that uh, you are a mentor under such and such thing but what you do under the mentoring nobody is really monitoring and it is really, a, uh, uh, I, I would say it is not uh, being uh, handled properly today, the, the mentoring part of it, at least in India, whatever I have seen. Thank so, you so that much. is what uh, uh, kind of surprised me. I'm so sorry to cut you off. I think uh, we have time for just one more question. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Just bear with me for one second. Yep. Briefly. Uh. I'll be, I'll be fast. Thank um, you. Actually, I'll try to be fast, but I don't have a good answer to your question. So I, I went to uh, HBS, and I went to Wharton, and I worked in the finance industry. I have learned to succeed on men's terms. And this is a very confusing thing for me, right? I have learned to self-promote. I have learned to be the first one to raise my hand. I have learned to be the first comment in the classroom. And it is very confusing to me, and I think it's very confusing to a lot of women, whether we're succeeding according to our own identity or whether we're playing into something that we're supposed to be but in fact are not comfortable being. I can tell you that every single interview I've had in which I didn't get the job or in which I failed, I have questioned, hey, was I not good enough or are they biased? And I've never had clarity. I've never had clarity on whether it was something that I did or if it was the way that I was perceived. And that is a very, very insidious thing to deal with in your entire professional career. I don't pretend that this is a women's issue. It's, it, it, it affects all sorts of minorities and even some majorities. It, 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 it's, a, it's a very deep thing to think about. So to your question, should we change the interview process? I don't know. I don't, I don't know because I have conditioned myself to succeed in those terms. Uh, what I think would be valuable 
is for us to recognize that in whatever position of leadership or management, that there are many effective styles that are very different. And I was reminded of this last night, I was watching the US presidential debate. And women are perceived very badly in debates because of all these things that you know, we don't speak up and we don't interrupt. And if women interrupt, then they're, then they're bitches, right? And uh, that's, just, that's just a fact. It happened to Hillary. It's happening to Warren. It's happening to every single woman who's run for office, at least in the US. Um, but you know what? A president doesn't need to debate. Presidents don't debate. They don't, they don't go on the stage and defend their ideas in real time. They have a set of very good advisors and they listen to their advice, and they think about the problem deeply, one would hope, although not in all cases, and then they make a decision, right? That is a management style that we should be rewarding. So why are we selecting a president based on who debates well? Why are we selecting CEOs of companies based on who can debate best in an HBS classroom? I think that's wrong. And so I think if we're going to change the types of leaders that we see in politics, in the private sector, whatever, I think we need to change our mentality of what makes a good leader and what makes a good manager and make room for many different styles. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, good, good evening. My name is Mawa Tomotamai. I come from Botswana. My question isn't twofold, but it's embedded in the intersectionalities of women experiences um, in the lens of tech optimism, particularly for women who have been sidelined and excluded from formal structures of economic from formal structures of economies, um, particularly in Southern Africa, that there have been so many women who aren't necessarily within the lines of inclusion of the economic or political societies, however, have been able to use technology towards their advantage in building their own economic systems in um, their relevant communities. Um, for me there, I see a lot of opportunity for solutions and policy reform and policy change that actually affects the women who are living in the formal formal societies that are benefiting from the class societies based on race, based on class of gender, based on language, based on religion, and other forms of um, exclusionary powers, right? So my question to the panel one is that how can we use um, the power of women who are excluded from societies, rural women particularly, who have found technology and mobile penetration to try and uplift and reduce inequalities through an economic lens in their formal economies. And my second question is based on the transformative, transformative action versus ref reformatism, as to why particularly does a woman in tech typically have to be an expert in gender studies, when all you are is a woman passionate about what you're doing within the tech field? Thank you. If we could have some brief answers, whoever would like to uh, answer that. I can answer in five seconds your second question. Actually, I'm a woman in tech that was totally not aware about the gender gap, to be honest, until I became a platform owner and was, you know, face to face with the problem. So you don't have to be a gender expert. I'm definitely not. I'm into technology, but I definitely believe that, you know, I, I was face to face down with a problem and uh, I witnessed it. So then that's when I decided to do something about it. But honestly, before I haven't thought, I'm definitely not a gender expert, actually. I think that wraps up our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm so sorry, I think we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on your Wednesday night and it being so late, we really appreciate. If you do have any uh, other questions, you can approach the panelists afterwards. Thank you so much again. <laughs>